So many times, not every time, but so many times, the songs that we're singing are actually prayers that are put to music. And that's what that very song is. And I want us to not forget right now to continue to, to pray and seek the Lord and depend on Him. And I want to ask you to just I mean, bow again before the Lord. And, and uh, we're going to continue this prayer. So bow before the Lord right now. Um, maybe you could restate those words to the Father again. I depend on you. And just tell him, just acknowledge that again now with words, without the music. I depend on you. Recognize him for who he is, that he's the vine. Recognize before him who we are, that we're the branches. Father, there's so much help and hope and life in those very verses from John. And acknowledge that real life, lasting life, eternal life, abundant life is found in you. And we come from a week where we live in a world where lots of different things have tried to offer to us um, life. Thank you for the reminder today through song, through your word, that you're the vine, we're the branches. Lord Jesus, we praise you. You have come. You tell us it's the way and the truth and the life and that no man comes to the Father but through you. You tell us that you have come to give us life and to give us life abundantly. Thank you for that. Thank you for that free gift of life. Would you today take our hearts, our thoughts, our minds, all our different stories, and please just keep working on us. And I pray we'd walk out of this room today, this 8.30 hour, um, changed changed forever, more dependent on you, more alive in Christ. You know what every heart, what every life needs in this room right now. And so we believe in the Holy Spirit. And Spirit of God, would you speak corporately to us as a gathered church, personally to us. As people created by you, we want to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I stood before you last week and said, hey, don't forget. I'm standing before you again today to say, hey, don't forget. We started last week. We talked about all of our going and coming in our everyday life, how we can so easily forget things that are very important. And I would offer to you that the thing that we cannot forget to do is to pray. S.D. Gordon, writing about 100 years ago, said the, gre the greatest thing anyone can do for God and for man is to pray. It is not the only thing, but it is the chief thing. The great people of the earth today are the people who pray. I do not mean those who talk about prayer or those who say they believe in prayer, nor yet those who can explain about prayer. But I mean those people who take time to pray. These are the people today who are doing the most for God in winning souls, in solving problems, in awakening churches. And I go back to where we were last week to begin this morning to remind us that we, we, we don't just 
do a message and file it away and say that was for last Sunday, but to tie it together again to right where we are this morning, gathered again to remind us that the chief thing that we can do is pray. And what an incredible privilege God has given to us through Christ to be able to approach his throne and talk to him and commune with him and hear from him and take our burdens to him and celebrate our joys with him. And we, we, we gather in this place and we pray. Well, I want you to think with me again this morning about something else that we need not to forget. What's the most important thing that you've ever forgotten? I hope it's a funny story. I hope it's not a, a sad story. I hope if it is a sad story that maybe you've gotten to a point where you can laugh about it now. I mean, if you forgot the 25th wedding anniversary or you forgot the 16th birthday, I don't know, maybe there would be some things that could be pretty traumatic that you've forgotten over time. I'm sorry to scrape a scab off of something maybe that you've uh, put, put behind you already. Uh, when I think about the most important thing uh, ever forgotten, I was in the story. Thank the Lord I was not the feature of the story. But as a sixth grader, a middle schooler, you know how much bigger things can be as middle schoolers. And we were in a day middle schoolers, since gra sixth grade, Mount Hope School, where we still had what was called PE class. Any of you remember those? Uh, PE class, physical education class. It was a particular time where a new initiative started in our school where everybody had a uniform and everybody had an assigned spot on the gym floor. And regardless of what class period you had, you, you came rushing in from the last class you had to change from your clothes you wore to school into a PE uniform and I remember that year we had brand new purple and gold t-shirts and white gym trunks that were given to everyone you'd run in between classes change into those uh, uniforms come back out and take your spot on the floor and they introduced to us for me in Mount Hope a new vocabulary word and it was the word calisthenics. And I remember hearing that word, and I was excited for a moment about a big word until I realized it was just the Greek word for push-ups. And I, I, I'm joking, but it was, that's what it really turned out to be. And if you didn't get there on time, you had to do more calisthenics. You had to do more push-ups. And Jimmy A. came rushing in late when day for PE we're all in the room he gets in there late we all change we get out in our spots Jimmy A comes running out in his uniform that he had changed into and immediately these 30 middle schoolers including me all bursted out in laughter because Jimmy A had changed into his PE uniform and he got his t-shirt but he forgot his pants and 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 it, it was quite the moment uh, for a bunch of middle schoolers and uh, Jimmy A realized what had happened, returned to the locker room. I don't think we've ever heard from him again <laughs> since. But uh, it, was, it was definitely a moment where I'm sure that became the feature story for, you know, you know don't you love those times when people say, tell us your most embarrassing moment. And I always think Jimmy's probably just going to slip out the back when that comes up. But uh, we, we, we have a tendency to forget things. Hopefully they're not that traumatic, but uh, today I want to come back to you again for the beginning of this fall and say, don't forget. Last week, don't forget to pray. This week, I want to say to you, don't forget to connect. Don't forget to connect. I have a daughter that's uh, uh, new to Tampa, Florida in the last couple of weeks. As a parent, I remember thinking, I hope when Sunday rolls around that she'll be able to connect into a new church. I have a son that's waking up in a new town, in a new state this morning that's 19 years old. I'm hoping and praying as a parent that he'll be able to connect to a group of people, to a new church. I hope he doesn't forget. I'll probably help him not forget 
But I want to say to you in this room today, don't forget to connect. You can come here gathered in this room and find a seat and you can hide across three services in a big room like this and really never connect. But I want to exhort you and appeal to you today to connect to others. Uh, a personal relationship with Jesus is a necessity for salvation. Don't miss that. A, per, a personal relationship with Jesus is a necessity for salvation. A corporate relationship with others is a necessity for continuation. I hope that would catch your attention just a little bit. What are you saying, Pastor? A personal relationship with Jesus Christ is a necessity for salvation. And there may be one of you in this room today that needs to connect with Jesus. You need to connect with God. And the only way that you connect, can connect with God is to be reconciled to God. And the only way we can be reconciled to God is to connect with him through his son, Jesus Christ. We sang that song just a second ago, The Way, The Truth, The Life. What is, that song is talking about is right out of the Gospel of John, that the way to the Father, the truth about connecting to the Father is going through faith in Jesus Christ. The one who died to pay for your sin, that took the wrath of God for your sin. And when you receive that payment for your sin, you receive what Jesus Christ did for you, then you can connect with God in a personal relationship with God him it's salvation but for us to be able to continue in growing in our relationship with Christ in becoming more and more like Christ it takes relationships with other people we get the vertical relationship right with God and if the vertical relationship is right with God it always has an impact on our horizontal relationship with other people salvation is this overarching word that covers and the three big biblical words, justification, sanctification, and glorification. All of those are involved in our salvation. Salvation involves just justification. That's what happens through belief. When we believe in Jesus Christ in the courts of heaven, if you will, we are justified by faith. God looks at us. And the righteousness of Jesus Christ is credited to our account. Our sins are paid for. The wrath of God is satisfied. We are justified before God. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ today, that means, according to God's word, that you have been justified. You have been saved through your belief in Christ. Now, the second word is sanctification. And sanctification is what happens in our life as we live as we're transformed to be more and more like Christ glorification is what happens in the end when we see Jesus Christ in his fullness when we're together with him in heaven we receive a glorified body we're complete we're perfect we're in Christ we know all things in full we're with him but that glorification and that justification has something that happens in between and it's what happens here on this earth as we go through this process of sanctification. Have you ever had somebody kind of tongue in cheek say to you, oh, you're going through a hard time, you're, you're dealing with a tough person, you're dealing with a hard situation and they say, hey, just accept it. It's part of your sanctification process. It's the way that God uses his Holy Spirit to just work in our life to continue in our lives to grow us and to work out our salvation in everyday life now how does that happen when you read through the new testament you see that so much of that sanctification process happens by us being connected to other people look in the in the book of acts open your bibles here to acts chapter 1 the frustrating part of today's message is, is that there really 
could be a hundred different verses that we could go to to talk about the importance of connecting with others after we've connected with Christ in salvation. But we start in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, you have a risen Savior appearing to the disciples. In Acts, you have the story of the advancement of the kingdom. You have the story of the birth of the New Testament church. You have believers that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And in Acts chapter 1, Jesus gives this commission to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. And then he ascends to heaven. And the disciples are left looking and an angel says, hey, he will come back again. In the same way that he just ascended before you, he will come back again. And so they're left in this place where we're still left today. Now what? We're waiting on his return. And in Acts chapter 1, you see what happens. And it happens over and over, chapter after chapter, page after page throughout the New Testament. They come together and they pray. Look in chapter 1, verse 14. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. 26 times, I'm sorry, 26 chapters of the 28 chapters in Acts mentions prayer. That's why I would stand before you and say, don't forget to pray. First chapter, first gathering after Jesus ascends to heaven, with one accord, they were devoting themselves to prayer. I'm reading from the ESV. The very next word after prayer is the word that we're talking about this morning, together. They were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And then you just begin to kind of thumb through the book of Acts and you see this over and over again. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It just continued through the book of Acts. You come to Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. Can you you define being connected with any better phrase than that? I, I don't know of it. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. And the journey just happens all the way through the book of Acts. You see Peter with James and John. You see the apostle Paul in the book of Acts and in his letters, always together with people like Silas and Titus and Timothy and Luke and Onesimus and Barnabas and John Mark. Just page after page, letter after letter, you see this togetherness, this connectedness that when people had a relationship with Jesus Christ, you would see the overflow of that in that they were drawn together and connected with one another and connected to each other. And so today, taking the pattern of Scripture, 
the pattern of the New Testament church, the model of New Testament believers. I'm standing in front of you today at the beginning of a new season, the beginning of this fall time in our lives, and I'm saying to you, don't forget to connect. And I'm confident that there would be people in this room today that would say, I want to. Tell me how. I want to tell you how. And really, just a kind of a checklist in a way that you'd be able to say, well, at least I know how now. Here are 10 ways you can connect. Number one, connect through salvation. The ultimate way for you to connect is to connect in faith with Jesus Christ. We've already talked about that this morning. The connecting with other people in a heart and soul kind of way begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. And right here, at this point of the message, we don't have to wait to the end. You don't have to wait till this afternoon. If you know today, right now, that you do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then where you are seated in this room, or those who will watch this message maybe online, you can call out to Jesus, acknowledge to him that you're, you've sinned and that you're separated from him, ask for his forgiveness, and the Bible gives us the promise that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Right now, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and he was raised from the dead, you can stop trusting in whatever you've trusted in the past and turn and trust him, trust your life and follow him. Why not be saved right now? That would be the ultimate connection. Let me give you a second way. That'd be through baptism. You've already witnessed that today. At 9.45 today, I'll refer back to this hour of people being baptized. We're also celebrating at 11.15, more people will be baptized. When people are baptized, what they're doing is identifying publicly as a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not something that you do just because you're 10. It's not something that you do just because you're 12. It's not something that you do just because somebody else did it. It's something that you do regardless of what age, child, teenager, college student, senior adult. It's what you do after you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you're standing in that water as a testimony of your old life. When you're lowered into the water, it's a picture of your old life and your sins being buried. And when you raise up out of that water, we clap and we cheer and we celebrate because heaven celebrates. It's a picture of an old life being buried, sins being buried, rising up in new life. Even when they walk out of the baptistry, I always like to picture it. It's a picture of people walking into newness of life. Isn't that exciting when you see people publicly take a stand to follow Jesus Christ? And some of you need to do that very thing today. You've never publicly identified as a follower of Jesus Christ. You've never connected with a church family through baptism. And God would speak to your heart to say to you today, it's time. And I'd love to hear from you about that so we could schedule that in the days ahead. Here's a third way to connect, and that's through membership. Why not make this church family your home? Why not take on ownership here? Why not say, this is where I'm being fed, this is where I can serve, this is where I can grow, and this is the place that I want to be able to look at and say, that's the church family locally that I belong to. It's an easy process to get to that point of beginning membership here. Go online, watkinsville.org, look for membership, Four times a year, we have a class. We sit down, we talk about the history of our church, what our church is about. We learn about you. You hear what the expectations of membership are, and you hear what the benefits of church membership are. And I'd encourage you to consider making this your church home. Anchor here among this body. Here's a fourth way, and that's to connect to a group. Connect to a group. What's a group? A group is a group of people smaller than this group of people. 
It's a group of people where your name can be known, where you can be missed, where you can be... Um, where you can know others. Uh, people know when you're there. People know when you're not there. People look for you to see you coming. People look for you when they don't see you coming. It's a place for you to have accountability. It's a place for you to do life on life. It's a place, it's a, it's a group for you to be able to live out the one another's of Scripture. It's an environment for you to bear with one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to forgive one another. It's an environment for you to grow in your walk with Christ through relationships with others. We have uh, Sunday groups. We have weekday groups. And, and some of you may be in this room this morning, you've been coming for years, and you say, really? You think people come, look for a group? You're, many of you are part of a group. And people will sit here this morning, they'll walk onto this property today, and they'll think, I need a group. I want to know somebody. I want to connect with somebody. And if you're that person, today, again, you walk out of this room, there'll be people in the commons, they're standing there waiting, they're looking for you. We want to connect with you. In fact, here's the expectation. If you're in this room attending Watkinsville, the expectation is, is that every single person would be connected with another group of people, a place where people can know you, celebrate with you, grieve with you, grow with you, hurt with you, uh, laugh with you, study the word with you, a place where we can be connected. Our groups are relational environments where we study the Word, get to know each other. They're available for adults, available for college students, available for teenagers. Connect with a group. Here's a fifth way. Connect with a class. We're offering classes this fall that meet on Wednesday nights. They're learning environments. We'll have a women's group, on, a women's class on Wednesday night that will study through Acts. We'll have a men's group that meets together on Wednesday night. We have a missions group that meets on Wednesday night. And uh, it's an opportunity for you to connect. Here's a sixth way, serve. One of the ways that will deepen your connection with other people is to serve alongside other people. I think about relationships that have been built in our children's ministry. Uh, people that have been serving together, pushing babies together, rocking babies together teaching kindergartners together. So many times I'll hear people talk about serving and it's very rare that I'll hear a person say uh, they serve alone. Many, many times I'll hear, uh, yeah, Eric and Tom, um, they'll say, we, we, we teach middle schoolers or we lead a small group. We have a group on Sunday morning. Serve together. Get somebody to come with you and say, hey, let's, let's take on this together. Let's be greeters together. Let's be ushers together. Let's teach this class together. Serving is a way to deepen your connection. Seventh way is giving. You know what happens when you start investing uh, in, a, in a body of believers? Exactly what the Bible says. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Here's how I'm going to know those two kids of mine that are going to be in new cities, new states today. Here's one of the ways that I will know they really are invested and in connecting with a new body. When their gifts stop showing up here and their gifts start showing up there. And I will know that place has become the place where they're connected. They're investing their heart and their life into that place. Here's an eighth way. Go on a mission trip. Go on a mission trip. Some would have a testimony in this room that the way they got connected in the life of this church is that they suffered through some hard environments on a mission trip. And, and I would exhort you, one of the reasons, yes, take the gospel to the world, but another way to connect with a church body is to take a trip in a cross-cultural situation and see the world together and share the gospel together, and it will help you to connect. Here's a ninth way. Attend a connect event. What's a connect event? 
In August, we have a women's gathering. Take a step of faith. Venture out. Show up. You'll meet some ladies at a table that you'll sit with. Maybe they'll be lifelong friends. Senior adult men, you're looking for somewhere to connect? This week, Tuesday of this week, senior adult men, gather on this property for a luncheon. It's an opportunity for you to connect. It happens in every environment. College students, I can't tell you the dozens of ways that are available to you this month for you to connect. You just got to go to Watkinsville.org, click on college, and you'll see a long list of opportunities. Or walk right out in this commons, find a guy named John, find a girl named Rachel, find a guy named Taylor. They'll help you to connect and begin connecting with the body believers here at this church. Here's the tenth way. Come to the welcome table. So, Pastor, I didn't hear a word you said in the last 20 minutes. Here's the easy Walk out those doors, go to the welcome table. We'll help you right there to connect. Now, I got five minutes. I want to flip the script. I think for four years, I've been coming out of that curtain right there, sitting down right there, walking up on the stage, coming right here. For five minutes, I want to come at something from a different direction. All right? I want to flip a script. And I want to speak to those of you, not that are looking to connect. I want to speak to those of you in this room that need to be connectable. I heard some words this summer that convicted me and also broke my heart. I heard it from two different sources, two different families, new families into our community. One said these exact words. One thing I've learned about living here is that Oconee people apparently don't need any new friends. Apparently Oconee people don't need any new friends. They said, I've tried and I've tried, and I've tried, and I cannot get connected with other people. Look in your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I want to read one verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. The Apostle Paul A strong believer saying to a church in Corinth this phrase. Make room in your hearts for us. Make room in your hearts for us. And in these closing minutes, I want to plead with you as your pastor to make room in your hearts for other people. It's so easy for us who already consider ourselves connected to forget that we're surrounded by people who are bouncing all around us, looking, hoping that there would be some way that they might find somebody that would make room in their life for them. So many times when new people arrive in a new setting, the story, the testimony will be this. Well, I got to this place, I got to this school, I got to this town, I got to this college, I got to this dorm, and the testimony would be this. By their own admittance, I got in with the what? Wrong crowd. I got in with the wrong crowd. Or they will say, I got left out or rejected by another crowd. I'm living in a neighborhood right now with an elderly man who shared with us this year that the reason he doesn't go to church is because as a child he was rejected by the local church that he attended once. He was laughed at because of what he wore that morning church 
the Apostle Paul would say, make room in your hearts for us. What can you do in your life to clear out some stuff, to reschedule, to create some margin, to create some connectability in your life, to make room for people? Could you, here, let, me, let me give you these phrases. I gave those looking to connect some phrases. Let me give some phrases for us that need to be connectable. Ten of these. Use phrases like this. I'm going to put hey in front of every one of these, all right? Just for friendliness. Hey, come eat with us. Hey, go with us. Hey, sit with us. Hey, join us. Hey, meet with us. Hey, we'll call you. Hey, we'll pick you up. Hey, we'll save you a seat. Hey, hang with us. Hey, we'll look for you. Too many times we say, hey, and keep moving. I'm saying to you today, say, hey, and add an us to it. Make room in your hearts for people. What if we're living in Oconee County is more about others than it is ourselves? Do you know a guy named Joseph who was a Levite? Throughout the New Testament, Joseph, who was a Levite, sold a piece of land and helped the church. He found a guy named Paul and he connected him with a church in Jerusalem. He found a guy named Paul and he went to church with him and he went on a mission trip with him. John Mark was sent home by the Apostle Paul and this guy named Joseph took him in and said, he'll go with me. And some of you are saying here today, I don't know that Joseph, but you do know Barnabas, don't you? Same guy. Barnabas was given that name because he was a son of encouragement. And I'm saying to you in closing today, the most encouraging work you can do for another person is to make room for them in your life. Let's make room for people to connect don't forget to connect don't forget to be connectable let's pray together father would you help us to open our hearts and open our lives to people around us would you open our eyes to see people open our ears to hear people Open our hearts to love people. Open our lives to welcome in people. King Jesus, thank you for welcoming us. And I pray that, Lord, that my horizontal, my, my vertical relationship with you as my Savior would overflow into my relationships with others here in this life. In Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.